Arizona is next up in our focus on the seven swing states that will determine the presidency. Today's guest is the Arizona Republic's Mary Jo Pitzel, who talks about why a state so long in the Republican column is now one that's truly up for grabs and may not be decided until well after Election Day. From Ballard Studios in Washington, D.C., another special election edition of 13th and Park. You and I can differ, but that doesn't mean you and I cannot be friends. That often is missing in politics. We went from North Korea to Eminem. That's a lot, man. Aliens could have invaded and nothing would surprise me at this point. It's a nightmare. Those are the facts. We have to solve everything. What's in this tea? <laughs> Mary Jo, welcome to the show. Let's talk about history a little bit. Only two Democrats have prevailed in the presidential sweepstake in Arizona in the last 65 years. One was Bill Clinton. And then, of course, in 2020, Joe Biden, I think it was 11,000 votes or so. 10,567, I think. <laughs> I love that. I mean, as a veteran of the, the recount in Florida in 2000, I know the number 537 to this moment. <laughs> that was the number, right? What do you think in 24 may be different than what was in play in 2020 in terms of the demographics and the dynamics of the Arizona electorate this year? I don't really know if it's all that different. We've seen some shifting within the Latino vote, which is not a monolith. And we're seeing more evidence of that with Latinos, especially men, favoring Republican candidates. You have more urbanization, which has brought in people who are willing to split their tickets. They're Republicans who haven't been happy in the Trump era and will vote no at the top of the ballot, but still the legislature, county offices, you know, they'll, they'll go back to the party label. So I don't think much has changed. And I think that's why it's you know viewed as a swing state. There was just a locally run poll that came out two days ago that showed Trump with a six tenths of a percent lead <laughs> over Harris. But mm. that's an increase for him. A couple weeks ago, she had like a three point lead over him. So he's gaining. Clearly, you are the only swing state in play that's right there along the U.S.-Mexico border. How has immigration played into the dynamics of the Arizona electorate, and not just in the presidential campaign, also in the congressional campaigns, there are at least two that seem to be very competitive, and of course, the U.S. Senate Derby? Oh, it's a huge factor. It is the number one issue, you know, rivaling with the economy. A lot of people point to the Biden policies that started, you know, soon after his um, administration came in, where they did allow people to come across the border, you know, claiming asylum, um, et cetera, et cetera. That did result in a lot of people at times stacked up along the border, and it's continued. It's also really gotten uh, tied up with the fentanyl, the anti-fentanyl message. I mean, the evidence shows that most of the fentanyl is brought in through legal ports by U.S. citizens. But of course, there are you know drug smugglers who are coming across the border. And so it's just this very strong belief that you go down to the border and you're just going to see people stacked up, which really isn't the case, especially ever since the Biden administration last spring, early summer, sort of reverted back to a more restrictive policy at the border. Mm -hmm. But it is top of mind, so much so that in Arizona, we had a citizen's initiative to put abortion access on the ballot. Huge, huge issue, incredibly popular. The legislature, in an attempt to try to counter that and give people something to vote for as opposed to against, mm -hmm. came up with their own version of a border bill, which is problematic because it would give power to local authorities to detain people who they have found coming across the border other than at a legal port of entry. That's a federal duty, not a, a state duty. You would have thought we would have learned that during the Joe Arpaio era <laughs> when he was stopping immigrants and right. taking on duties that were the federal government's. So this goes to the abortion issue that you referenced. I think it's right to call it a trigger law, right? Going back to the 1800s with a law that was on the books that essentially, to some extent, criminalized abortion. That is what this amendment is trying to fight. Is that right, Mary Jo? Well, that law has been repealed. The infamous 1864 almost total ban on abortion, yep. the legislature back in, in the spring got rid of it, which has then left us with 
a 15 week abortion ban. And of course, this is all happening after the Dobbs decision, which um, got rid of Roe v. Wade. So what's been fueling it is the sense that Arizonans want to have their own say on what are the proper limits on abortion policy. And Proposition 139 says we would make it up to viability, which is basically what Roe did. And it allows some exceptions beyond that viability point, which is usually 23 to 24 weeks. weeks. Right. The 1864 law that you've referenced, though, really fueled um, the drive to get something in Arizona's constitution that really codifies what the rules are. In most of the country, in most of the swing states, the number one issue is the economy. It's not immigration and it's not abortion, but the economy is kind of the universal issue across America right now. What part of that do you think is most resonant among Arizona voters, especially those who possibly, (laughs) unbelievably, are still undecided as we move into the last part of this campaign? I would say it's housing prices and grocery prices are the things that people constantly point to. And when presented with the data on how the inflation rate has come way down, I mean, we're what, in a 3% range on the numbers of job growth here in Arizona, our, our economy is doing quite well. They just can't get past the things that they see in everyday life, which is rents are high. You know, you can't afford to buy a home. Home prices are, you know, through the ceiling. Glad I bought a long time ago, but, you know, it's and I feel bad because it's like I got mine. But what what is there for like my younger colleagues and and grocery prices? So that does resonate very, very strongly. A year ago, our legislature repealed a tax that was on rents Mm -hmm. supported by Republicans, opposed by the Democrats, because the consequence of getting rid of the rental tax is it took away revenue from the city. But it was a very popular issue, and it's coming up in all of our legislative races. Let's talk about two voter groups that may look small in percentage, but may make all the difference in the world if you start looking underneath the numbers. Mormons and Native Americans. So apparently, I think about 5% of the population in Arizona is Mormon. And then you have significant pockets of Native American population, especially in places like Apache County. If this is truly a 0.6 percent race kind of race, could those two voter groups on the margins make a fundamental difference? Oh, yes. I mean, as you well know, anytime anything is so close, you know, any one little movement could be the difference. That's why we have Mormons stepping up and saying we just can't vote you know, for Trump for president, because they realize that that kind of message could make a difference in the outcome. You know, it's hard to quantify it, you know, but I've had other people say, look, that's just, you know, a small renegade group that Mm -hmm. does not represent the overall Mormon population. But you also have to factor in where women come in on these issues, because that's where abortion really comes to the forefront um, in terms of helping to determine a vote. The Native vote has always been fairly strong for Democrats, Mm -hmm. but it is meeting them where they are, talking to them and activating that vote. There's also the former president of the Navajo Nation is a Democrat running for Congress. It's maybe a long shot bid, but that's going to bring a lot of voters out to get Jonathan Nez elected for a congressional seat. And that might affect turnout as well. Obviously, a lot of focus beyond the presidential race is on the U.S. Senate race. Once again, the name Carrie Lake has <laughs> presented herself for consideration up against Ruben Gallego. It seems like consistently the Democrat has held an edge all the way through. Is that still a race? Even if Donald Trump carries Arizona, does that race become more and more difficult for Republicans to imagine winning? I suspect that that's the trajectory. I mean, Things are narrowing, as they often do, as you're getting very close um, to Election Day. And as you know, we've had thousands and thousands of ballots already cast because we were a big early voting state. But as you know, the polls have consistently shown Gallego, the Democrat, with the lead, sometimes a very commanding lead. And Lake's fundraising has not been able to keep up with his. She's not getting support from Mitch McConnell's group as they're looking for viable candidates so that they can take back control of the U.S. Senate. I don't like to predict, but it doesn't look real good for her. But things are narrowing and um, she's in there fighting till the end. Two congressional districts in particular are very much in play. One in six. Which one are you focused on? Mostly one, because not that I'm doing the coverage, but I know 
both of the candidates, one of them long time ago, state legislator, another one recently left the legislature. This is in the northeastern part of the Phoenix area, Scottsdale, Fountain Hills, rather affluent area. And David Schweikert has been representing that district for more than a decade. Right. He has had close, close races for the last four cycles, mm -hmm. I think, and they just can't shake him. You know, he has a lot of staying power. This year, his opponent is Amish Shah, who is an emergency room surgeon, right. fresh out of the state legislature and very much a centrist in terms of how he navigated um, at the state legislature. And that race is going to be a nail biter. That's the one that we're focused on. And also that district includes what we like to refer to as sort of the blue belt with our freeway system around the valley. Mm -hmm. Those are split ticket voters. The Republicans will leave the Republican column and vote, for example, as they did for Katie Hobbs for governor mm -hmm. two years ago over Carrie Lake. Right. So that will be a factor as well in Schweikert's race. I know the one thing you don't want is what happened four years ago when Maricopa County in particular <laughs> became the focus of headlines for all the wrong reasons, right? What in the last four years may have taken place so that there could be more confidence that an election result, especially in Maricopa County, will be coming not weeks after the fact, but soon after the fact, and that people can can take it to the bank? Well, I don't know that results are going to come out any faster. The county recorder in Maricopa, which is the largest county in the state, um, has said it'll probably be 10 to 15 days after the election until wow. they have everything done. The reason it takes so long is that when a race is close, every vote matters. And yeah. um, a lot of people get those early ballots. They come to their homes. They sit in the pile. People vote them and then drop them off at the polls on election day. And that takes a while to process the thousands and thousands of ballots that get dropped off because you've got to open the envelope. You've got to compare signatures. You've got to give people time to cure their ballot if there's a question about their signature. So that's going to affect things. Um, but I will say county officials have been working like triple time to be transparent. They've led groups and groups of people through their tabulation center to show what they do, to explain how the equipment works, to explain how the process works. Whether that's going to you know, mean much to bolster confidence, um, I don't know. But clearly, you know, if, if a race is close, you're going to have people complaining, even when down ballot, you know, other races, maybe for the same party, are just landslides, are very lopsided. Like you mentioned that, you know, Arizona is a swing state. Right. It is maybe way at the top of the ticket. But when you get down to more localized um, races, it's still very much a right-leaning state. Like many other states, especially swing states, Mary Jo, generally the rural areas will come in faster or more completely than the urban areas, which leads to a, they call it a blue tide. So in the beginning of an election night, it may be that Republicans in Arizona are faring well. But as the night wears on, those margins that they're up could really change and change dramatically. Say Donald Trump is up early and then suddenly it gets to be what it was like in 2020, which is too close to call. Yes. In fact, it's so funny you mentioned that because I'm just listening to a podcast about the Bush v. Gore race. It's mm. just riveting um, to sort of relive all that. And um, yeah, we very well may have that. In Arizona in 2020, it took until the Saturday after Election Day for the presidential race to be called. And again, the, the call is done you know, by the media, people that you know are looking at computer models and forecasting. But no election is actually final until it's certified. And that's you know the whole business of what the election officials do. But yes, we could see a lot of swings. Um, on election night and then in the ensuing days. So buckle up, uh, <laughs> watch Arizona, envy our weather, because I think by then we will be below 100 degrees. Um, but political temperatures will be way above that. I just remember an experience where it was midnight in Phoenix. I was standing outside of a hotel at midnight. It's 102 degrees. And someone looked at me and said, oh, it's dry heat, not wet heat. And I said, no offense, but 102 degrees at midnight, that's hot on almost anyone's scorecard. I hope the politics that you've been reporting on and that are about to play out are a little bit less hot than they have been in the past. It's been crazy. We had former President Clinton was here yesterday. Tim Walls was here earlier in the week. Trump's coming today. J.D. Vance was here. 
I mean, it's you can't even keep track of it anymore. There's so many rallies and so many people dropping in. Obama was in Tucson last week, and it's going to keep up like that. It's a, sort of a fun place to be that way, but makes it very hard to foresee how this vote's going to go. I look forward to reading your stuff after the fact. I hope after the fact is not months later. I hope it's a matter of days. And again, thanks for being on the show. We really appreciate your time. Great. Yeah, please follow our coverage on um, azcentral.com. We're all things elections for the next, probably through the end of the year. (laughs) Thanks a lot, Mary Jo. Be good. Thanks so much. 